Okay, we're going to get started, please. Yeah, please take your seat, if you or not. I'm Terrence Miller. I'm the treasurer of the uh, of the IAA and a professor at the University of California at Irvine. I'm going to be moderating this these two uh, keynote sessions, and I'll introduce the speakers uh, before they speak. So I'll start with with uh, Rosa Fruto who studied philosophy and history, sorry, philosophy and literary theory and sociology at the, at the University of Frankfurt am Main and in Paris. Um, he did his habilitation in Frankfurt. Um, he was an associate professor of philosophy in Munster, uh, but for a long time, um, professor at the University of Amsterdam, for several years, chair of the philosophy of art and culture. Since 2003, he has been co-editor of the Zeitschrift für Aesthetik und Allgemeine Kunstwissenschaft, and he is now, as of 2020, Professor Emeritus at the University of Amsterdam. He's written a number of books. Uh, I mentioned a couple that have been translated from German into English, uh, so available in either edition. Um, Trust in the World, a Philosophy of Film, which appeared in English in 2020 and in German in 2013. The Impertinent Self, A Heroic History of Modernity, published in English in 2009 and German in 2004, and an earlier book, Aesthetische Erfahrung and Moralische Urteil, um, and that was from 1996. The uh, title of his talk, as you can see, is Giving Birth to Feelings, the Presentative Power of Art. So it's welcome, Professor Kutu. Well, uh, thank you for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you to the organizers, uh, Rodrigo and the whole team. Uh, you, you do a, a, a tremendous job. Um, <laughs> great. Um, what I want to do tonight is indeed uh, presenting you something of my recent work that just came out in, uh, in German. Um, it's about uh, democracy of feelings, or emotional democracy, as Anthony, Anthony Giddens once said. And I present you a, a, a part of that. So the idea of democracy is based essentially on the concept of self-determination. Free and equal political subjects have the possibility to shape the way in which issues are debated and legislated. This idea is linked with a concept of reason which tends to include effects and emotions. The process of debate and legislation should, understandably, be defined by good arguments and not by rhetorical tricks, psychological manipulation, or even raw violence. But the idea of rational debate in political issues comes up against fundamental objectives. Firstly, an obvious reference can be made to the factual circumstances which can show that political debates are never, at least not completely, devoid of feelings. Accordingly, realist political philosophy has known since the early 16th century, since Machiavelli, that the best way to exercise power is to inspire the feelings of love or fear. In the 20th century, fascism succeeded in a fatal synthesis that seems perverse only at first glance. The leader, the Führer, is loved by the fear he spreads. Today, political strategists, under the, the, the sign of populism, try to serve those two feelings equally. Secondly, a cultural historical analysis, or in Nietzsche's uh, terminology, a genealogy of Western thinking, implies that a continual stressing of the reasonable can in itself be interpreted as passionate and therefore irrational. And finally, various philosophical, psychological, and more recently 
um, neuroscientific objections have cast serious doubt on the fundamental idea of reason and emotion being mutually exclusive. So nobody believes that any longer. Taking up these fundamental considerations, the crucial question, therefore, has to be not whether feelings play a role in democratic debate, but to what extent and in what sense. And to this question, there are several, I think, convincing answers. I would like to concentrate on one of them in the following, namely on the one that can be introduced under the academic keyword presentation or production of presence. Feelings demand representation. And my additional thesis is that this can be achieved in an excellent and popular way through art and popular culture, in general through aesthetic phenomena. On the level of philosophy, it is Spinoza and Deleuze who offer themselves as explanatory instances against the background of the so-called effective term in the humanities and certain sciences. Above all, it is Deleuze who offers himself for the thesis of the presentative power of art. But he is ambiguous. My plea in the third thesis is not with him as a theorist of effect, but with the alternative theorist of extended reason. So this is what I would like to demonstrate in 40 minutes, that means now in 35 minutes. Um, and yeah, this is the book I, I told you about uh, in, that came out in German, and I, I'm presenting a part of that for you. So, feelings, the first thesis, demand representation. In the language of German idealism and romanticism, they must be objectified externalized or expressed. If the inner does not turn to the outside, if it remains inner, it is not manifest, ready to hand, something we can grasp. We do not even know what we are dealing with. We only feel that something is, but not what is. In the language of scholasticism, which then comes up again in existentialism, so from the late Schelling, Bayer Kierkegaard to Heidegger and Sartre, the sensation of quantitas must pass over into the cognitive perception of quiditas, thatness and whatness, quantitas and quiditas, presentation and representation of something. The German language has a, has a term that, that is an umbrella term, maybe the, the term Darstellung. The German word Darstellung means presentation and representation at the, the same uh, time. So representation is conceptual representation of something. Presentation means a process of making present that grants the non-conceptual a kind of articulation that does not dissolve it in the conceptuality of language. We call non-conceptual, or following Adorno, non-identical, what resists attempts to conceptualize and identify it. With the more recent theory trained by psychoanalysis and neuroscience, for example by Antonio Damasio and Ephraim Masumi, one can say that an emotion has meaning, quiditas, whereas an effect is without explicit meaning, and thus is pure qualitas. It is an evaluative but non-cognitive sensation. An emotion is an articulated effect. An effect is a non-articulated emotion. An effect evaluates without words, an emotion without the appropriate words. 
In a second step, one can reformulate this and say that an emotion is an effect tamed by the subject and therefore secondary in its meaningfulness. The subject in its self-consciousness is regarded as an instance of domination and oppression, which implies that in the oppressed lies the truth. So this is what the political left theory of effect emphasizes, uh, Masumi. It's a political left group theory. Admittedly, this comparison is too simple. The dichotomy must be differentiated in several ways. First of all, it seems appropriate to think of feeling as a type term. It seems extremely difficult to grasp it as a logical class concept. There are feelings that involve a specific bodily state, the shivering of fear, for example, while others, such as nostalgia, are not linked to physicality, at least not in the same way. Some feelings are short-lived, explosive. Others, jealousy, long lived. Between the alternative of an essentialist definition, a class definition, on the one hand, and dissolution of the definitive into a Wittgensteinian family resemblance, there is a third option of insisting on aspects of a thing, here the feeling, that do not always occur. So those characteristics do not always occur, but often or frequently, and this is called a typological definition. <clears throat> On the basis of this type theory, it is recommended to distinguish between effect, sensation, emotion, and mood. An effect, I already told you, following uh, Masumi and Damasio, is then a physiological, non-cognitive, but evaluative sensation. We evaluate something as positive or negative even before the intervention of language and cognition. From, yeah, William James is the starting point for that, uh, for, for that tradition. Secondly, a sensation may be called a consciously made effect. Consciousness on a first level. We are able to give a name to a sensation. And so we feel something we call hunger, sexual need. An emotion is mostly, mostly, intentional about something. We have fear about something. Here we are on a second level of consciousness. It becomes clear also by the fact that an emotion is psychosocially constructed and dramatized. Psychosocially constructed because it is formed out in a social context and dramatized in the sense of being meaningfully portrayed. Or present. <laughs> At this point, we have a need for the first time the aesthetic aspect in the theory of feelings. We have to dramatize essentials we call feelings. They have to be dramatized. A mood, the last uh, differentiated part, is also complex. This becomes obvious when one tries to describe despair, depression, sadness, anxiety, the boredom, cheerfulness. Try to describe it. And then you see how complex these feelings or moods are. So therefore, it has been suggested with good reasons, I think, that at least emotions and moods are complexes which are composed of components and furthermore integrated narratively. Emotions and moods consist of equally important components, affective physiological component, behavioral com com uh, component, a cognitive component, and imagination as component. Then the question arises how these combo components combine to form the unity of a feeling, and the answer is that this is done through narrativity. 
part of which is imagination. In philosophy, especially the, the hermeneutic school of thought, has presented the theory of narrative identity, according to which we understand ourselves only by telling our story. So time and narrative, talk and we see the three volumes of uh, Paul Ricoeur stand out in this regard. Accordingly, only narration, including imagination, is capable of giving a sensual experience of time. How can we have a sensual experience of time? For Ricoeur, Marcel Proust, with his work In Search of Lost Time, plays a significant role. Literature and, as we could add today, opera, drama, film, offer us patterns of interpretation or exemplary stories. I would like to add that arguing for a component and narrativity theory does not include the claim that feelings like emotions and moods are necessarily bound to language. Otherwise, one would have to deny them to animals, to infants, and to the experience of music. The love of dogs for their owners is proverbial. But one can study, can study, as I learned, feelings like fear or depression, even depression. Dogs can be depressed, rats can be depressed, I learned, as well. So we can learn from psychological and psychoanalytic research that in early infancy, the so-called passive experience of receiving comfort, of being hold and love, removes the sense of helplessness we are confronted with after being born. This must be called an experience, a distinct something. Though the infant does not have concepts, concepts to identify that distinctness. Finally, music can be described as a form of presentation of feelings. Expression in music means more than linguistic expression. It is certainly related to linguistic expression. But at the same time, we realize that we aren't successful in describing what we are listening to, that what we are listening to resists our descriptions. From the perspective of philosophical aesthetics, one consequently needs a theory of linguistic similarity of music a theory of linguistic similarity of music as exemplarily formulated. That's the reason why I show you Adorno, because he's one of the protagonists here. This brings me to my second thesis. Feelings demand not always directly, but always indirectly aesthetic representation. The bridging concept is that of narrativity. When viewed in terms of argumentation theory, narratives have an exemplary value. Immanuel Kant proposes this in his critique of judgment. Example means a case of a general or a universal, which is at the same time a prototypical example meaning a representation of a general of, or of a universal. When we have an aesthetic experience that is an exemplary experience, we are unable to state explicitly a universal role, rule, sorry, determining our experience, but nevertheless we expect others, and we may expect others, ideally everyone, to agree with our experience. So this is the first meaning of presentation in art, or in a wider sense, presentation in aesthetic experiences. Accordingly, a work of art or an aesthetic experience communicates a feeling of something universal in an exemplary way. In other words, closer to, to Hegel, Art is a sensory presentation of something universal 
instead of a conceptual representation. So, what anger is, we know only since Homer and Achilles, or the Old Testament, in a creative translation, of course, from the Hebrew into Portuguese or German. In, 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 in German, it was Martin Luther, right? What vengeance is, we know by reading how Odysseus kills the soldiers who loiter in his house and harass his wife, or we know by watching the bride, Yuma Thurman, work through her <laughs> death list in Quentin Tarantino's Kill, Kill Bill. What love is, we also know from philosophers, but the classical texts refer to are typically written in a style that crosses the line to literature. Plato's Symposium, Augustine's Confessions, Hegel's Lectures on Fine Art, Kierkegaard's Diary of the Seducer. Psychology and psychoanalysis also gives us explanation, but we learn just as much, perhaps most, from literature, drama, opera, and film, from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Marigot's Comedies of Love, Goethe's The Suffering of Young Werther, Heine's ironic romantic poems of love, Stendhal's Le Rouge et le Noir, Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, Verdi's La Traviata, and yeah, here he is again, Proust, <laughs> à la recherche du temps perdu. In our time, Movies exploit the richness, of, the richness of that tradition, especially movies exploit that richness, along with magazines and advertising. So think of uh, Eva Illus has written a wonderful book about that, um, describing a, the dual process that commodities are romanticized as cosmetics, soaps, diamonds, diamonds are forever, clothes or cars become effectively charged. And on the other side, romance is commodified as rendezvous proceed according to a particular pattern of consumption. You go to a cozy restaurant, you need candlelight, you need a soft kind of music in the background. These this are our features we learn from movies, magazines, advertising. Or think of the day of dating apps. Yeah. It's a, commodi a commodification of Romans. A wonderful example. So what a feeling is, we know in detail only through a work of art and popular culture. Art is a child of time. Who, who would doubt that? But at the same time, this is Kandinsky, often mother of our feelings in that it gives birth to a feeling. It gives a form and a name. It does this against a certain cultural background on which it depends, and yet it also leaves this background behind and becomes relevant for the people of different cultures. And so Achilles, the famous, infamous hero of the 8th century before Christ, remains a hero also in our days. Even if he sometimes looks like a Hollywood star. <laughs> Thus, art, or the aesthetic, is presentative in this exemplary sense. That's the first meaning. And in addition, there is a second meaning. Art or the aesthetic is also presentative in an existential, existential, phenomenological sense. This dimension has, of course, been elaborated above all by Martin Heidegger. Hans Georg Gala, the authority of modern philosopher of hermeneutic, belongs to this tradition, as does Susan Langer in her philosophy in a new key from 1942. George Steiner, with his theologically influenced Real Presences, 1986. Jean-Luc Nancy, with his book The Birth to Presence, 1993. 
And finally, Hans Ulrich Kumprecht researches around the production of presence in evangelical texts. Adorno's aesthetic theory also contains an apt description of the presentative power of art. He once refers to Etruscan vases in the Villa Giulia, so the, the, the Etruscan museum in Rome, and claims that they are, quote, eloquent in the highest degree. We have to deal here with the paradox of Adorno, a mute language, speechless speech, or with a resemblance to language that touches most closely with a here I am, or this is what I am. This here I am, or this is what I am, means in traditional philosophical terminology that being there, quaditas, existence of things in contrast to their being what? Quiditas, essence, to which I have already referred. Epistemologically, we have to say it refers to showing or the self showing, that to which one points and that which shows itself. Adorno writes, I mean, it's interesting, right? I, 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 I'm using a highly given terminology, but it's, 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 it's Adorno. <laughs> Adorno writes in his aesthetic theory, quote, images say, they say, behold, look, look at me. They point to something. They call for looking, for sensual perception, and in the literal sense, for insight. The insight is a sight to see the truth. From a perspective of theory of truth, now you won't be surprised with my next, my next short step, uh, we need for this, to make this plausible, uh, how, how, how can you understand this phenomenological existential meaning of presence? Well, we need a theory of truth that is, in fact, a theory of evidence. And again, where, where does this tradition come from? It's the phenomenological tradition. It's, it's Husserl, it's Heidegger. Evidence is an act of direct, immediate, or intuitive experience. Such an experience can be performatively generated, but not methodologically proven. It centers at something that shows itself, not something that refers to something else, and thus has the function of a sign. One perceives something for the sake of its perceptibility, not because of what it might mean. You are not interested in meaning. You are interested in the thing. Describe the thing. Don't come up with meanings. Let it be start. Don't think. Look. So, yeah, I don't need Wittgenstein here. And you see, I, I, I mean again Kant, because in Kant's terminology, this is disinterested, the disinterested perception we learn from aesthetics. I mean, so many things are said about with Kant and disinterest in that this is so bourgeois, we can't take that, it's impossible. I said, no, come on, don't think, look. And then you see this, that disinterest in it is a basic phenomenological perception. If you want to go a little bit further, you know it's dangerous, I only wrote it down because I have to, as a serious, as a serious scientist, we, we have to say this is what there is. But I would add with the last point, be careful. So love. Uh, the Heideggerian, Anna Arendt uh, tradition goes back to Augustine. Why is love a translation of that relationship, that existential relationship? Because love in Augustine <laughs> means volo ut sis. I want that you are. That's it. Right? This is a phenomenological, uh, basic uh, starting point. So to avoid the last misconception, I finally want to remind 
you to the dialectical thesis that there is no presence without representation. No immediacy without mediation. The presence the, the, the artwork provides is thoroughly artificial. It is the result of production. One of the many paradoxes we know from art. So, you see, I have to, I have to breathe in and I have still 10 minutes or so, right? I, I'm breathing now <laughs> um, because this is what I wanted to show you in, in the first step. Now, I, I told you I want to I wanna explain a little bit what I mean by the presentative power of art. I gave you those two meanings the exemplary meaning and the existential phenomenological meaning. This is what I mean when I say art has the power to present something. What I want to do in the last 10 minutes now is a kind of philosophical, finding out where we, where we could get philosophical, good philosophical reference for that. I mean, I, I you remember I, I was writing I was writing, I, I, I was writing the, philo the, the history of philosophy up and down, right? From, did I mention Plato? No, oh yes, Plato, oh, oh, <laughs> they, are, they are all there, right? Um, but in fact, I, have, I would say there are two philosophers stand out in our discussion when it is about the, the, the affirmative uh, approach to feelings uh, in the philosophical discussion, and that is uh, Spinoza and Deleuze. So this, you, you breathe in and, and follow me for the last uh, 10 minutes, please. Spinoza. Spinoza's theory of ethics is still, and you can see that in the, in the, really in the discussions that are going on for 30 years in a while, uh, very plausible. Uh, explained nowadays by psychoanalysis and neurosciences. Nevertheless, as to philosophical aesthetics, his theory is of little relevance. Spinoza does not contribute anything to the presentational performance of art. But he does can contribute to two other achievements, which I would like to mention very briefly. First, the transformative aspect. Oh, Joseph, you are late. The transformative aspect. Affects or passions are not defects that can be eradicated or must be eradicated. You know, so just shakes this. Why should, how, how, how do you come with such a thesis, come up with such a thesis? Liberation from effects is neither possible nor necessary. That's it. It is not necessary. Hey, you guys with your long Christian tradition, what are you doing? It's not possible and it is not necessary. That's the interesting point. It is rather sufficient to cultivate or to transform that. That's Spinoza's answer, that you can only overcome, you, you, I, I'm back again with love, the status of erotic love, that we, which are increased often to the point of, of pathology, right? You can't get sick of love. Literally, you can't get sick, you can get mad. So how, how can we avoid that? Well. Spinoza's answer, transform it in an intellectual manner. His work is Amor Intellectualis Dei. That's the idea. Transform that feeling into a, another, maybe some people would say, to a higher level. But in any case, into another level. Thus, Effects can and must be transformed. Secondly, they can also be compensated. 
Spinoza is the first philosophical address when it comes to the elaboration of the compens uh, compensatory, yeah, compensatory <coughs> reaction of emotions. Famous quotation, there is no hope without fear, but there is also no fear without hope. This is the famous definition we have, one of the famous definitions. Whoever is accompanied by the fear of carrying an illness is also accompanied by the hope that he will be well, healthy. And vice versa, those who hope that something good will come to pass are not free from the fear that it will not. And what is true for an individual, Spinoza suggests, is also true collectively. A politics of fear, our politics, is thus appropriately countered with the politics of hope. The manipulative stoking of fear of the foreigners, the Jews, the Islam, the virus from China, etc., etc., is best countered with a narrative of hope. I have a dream, Martin Luther King. L'imagination au pouvoir, the students, 1968 in Paris. Yes, we can. But <laughs> more interesting for the understanding of the presentational performance of the aesthetic is, as I already said, the thinker of our days to whom we owe the actualizing rediscovery of Spinoza and Michel Together with Phoenix Guattari, he presents the connection between art and feelings in various books. I limit myself here to their last book, What is Philosophy? Almost done. Yeah. The work of art. Okay. This is where we are. The work of art is, as they say in that book, a block of sensations. Block de sensation. That is, a composition of percepts and affects. Percepts are not the same as perceptions, namely perceptions that are constitutively dependent on the perceivers, on subjects. And affects are not affectations, subjective feelings, but the kind of feelings that have a non-subjective, and that means above all, a non-conceptual character. They cannot be reduced to a concept. Philosophical aestheticians, from Baumgarten to Kant, and to Adorno, yeah, certainly agree with us. I, I would say this, this is common sense in aesthetics. So, what then is the specificity of the block of sensation? Deleuze and Guattari, not surprisingly, do not give a clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's what I have an advantage, right? If you don't give a clear answer, you have the freedom to be creative and do something by yourself. And that's one reason why we should go on at least one, to read the version of what I read. So sometimes their answer sounds affectivist, emotivist, with Hegel speaking as a defense of the immediate, of what, of what that which remains this side of all conceptual mediation. Scholastically speaking, the madness, the qualities. Sometimes, however, the answer sounds alternatively rationalistic, as pointing to a form of thinking, a form of rationality, that proceeds differently from the familiar forms of rationality, namely science and philosophy. While science thinks in propositional, truthful statements, and philosophy thinks in creating terms, the ego cogito, monad, transcendental, this is, this is philosophy, creating concepts. Art thinks sensually, which then means that it assembles sensual sensations. In doing so, it each time again removes the boundaries of habitual systems of perceptions 
experiences and feelings. So with this answer, the nurse that immediately remains within the habitual system of art perception in modernity. So there is gives a good answer, I would say, but it's a typical answer of modernity. Why? Because in modernity, art is seen as a specialist in you, in the new. So in our culture, in our different differentiated society, who, who's the specialist in the new? Well, it's art. Here you find it. Creative industries learn from art. So the first, the affectivist answer, sets its own accent in conjunction with the left political theory of affect. There is a primacy of the sensual bodily over the forms of feeling, thinking, and acting. <coughs> but there, the left-wing theory argues with a primacy of the sensual bodily dimension. I think this, this position is theoretically not convincing. It is conceptual, conceptually confusing. The brain thinks. Yeah? This, is, this is what I mean. Moreover, it opens the door politically to irrationalism and the terror of sensibility. Therefore, I prefer to leave the Deleuze in the alternative rationalist variant. In this way, he fits much better to the democratic, pronational dispute which forms a positive countervision to the authoritarian state mode models of our present. Democracy means a mobile, permanently circulating, informal discourse, a permanent exchange of experiences, half secured or completely unsecured opinions and more or less convincing arguments. It's a, it's, it's a polymorphous status. This is the everyday practice of collective self-determination that we call democracy. That's it. Yeah. This is this is it. And why should that be bad? My conclusion. A living democracy cannot be guided only by the idea of rational argumentation. I, I think we all agree with that. It is just as much dependent on the expression of feelings. But feelings, like so many other things, are a double-edged matter. Nothing great can be achieved without enthusiasm and passion. Hegel and Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, the, the essays that became so important for American civil rights movement. But Michael Watson once briefly added, so nothing can be, nothing great can be achieved without passion. Unfortunately, greatness can also be something terrible. Yeah, it's true. Thus, here I am again. The main problem is to what extent or in what sense feelings should play a role in democratic debate. At this point, aesthetics enters the stage. Literature, opera, film, and popular music offer us patterns of interpretation for our experiences and feelings. They offer us exemplary stories of what is important in our life. And this ethical achievement, it's an ethical achievement, has a political implication. In this respect, Aesthetics is a specialized medium of a modern democratic society to present and transform the feelings without which this society cannot exist. Thank you very much. Thank you.
very much. Um, we're going to be taking um, questions for, for both uh, keynotes at the end. Um, so I'm going to now uh, introduce uh, Fiona Hughes, our second keynote. Uh, Fiona Hughes is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. She's worked uh, particularly on concept epistemology and aesthetics, um, phenomenology, uh, particularly the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, the philosophy of art, and um, more recently, uh, uh, the dialogue of philosophy and archaeology. And I noticed in her publications that you have written on uh, Paleolithic cave art. Um, her books um, include Kant's Aesthetic Epistemology from 2007, um, just a conjunction of, of those uh, notions, and uh, a very helpful book for uh, beginners in Kant, which I think all of us um, are when we start to read them, uh, a, a Reader's Guide to Kant's Critique of Judgment from 2010. And as I said, she's published on Kivard, on Mero Ponti, and also on other topics in, in contemporary art and philosophy. So um, her presentation I'm reading now is thresholds of expression. I just wanted to see if there was a subtitle. Please take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, thank you to the whole wonderful team that have made all of this possible. And of course, to Rugby. I've got a lot of thanks to make in this talk, and some of the people who have helped me the most in my initiation into um, Brazilian archaeology are here, and that's really good for me. <laughs> well, at least I hope it's good, because of course it may not be, because you might think that, that I've got everything wrong, but hopefully I will get everything. Uh, so, um, as uh, any of you who have read the abstract for my paper um, will very quickly um, discover, things have changed somewhat since I wrote that abstract. So I hope you will bear with me. I will try to explain why it is um, that uh, things have changed. Um, in my presentation, I will investigate how the concept of liminality or threshold illuminates the importance of what I call emergent sense in expression and meaning. To be on a threshold is to be situated on a turning point between one thing and another. The emergence of sense is of paramount uh, importance in aesthetics in my view. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that it is one of the major contributions to aesthetics, both to philosophy and to interdisciplinarity more broadly. My larger project aims to show how a sensibility uh, for the emergent is particularly evident within prehistoric art. Um, on the way to getting a better understanding of the general um, importance of emergence for any expression, Today, I'm going to focus on some, particularly, uh, some particular exemplary examples from Brazilian rock art. The previous version of this paper started with what I knew, the European prehistoric, and some philosophy, and progressed towards what I did not yet know, but hopefully would come to know, Brazilian rock art. But then I arrived here, and I find that I did not have these things under control. I could not just use the moments I already had. Brazilian rock art was not going to wait around for me to catch up. I had, before I knew it, jumped into the middle of a deep pool. I had this emergency to find a way of keeping afloat, or I would sink and have nothing worth saying to you today. Or at least all I could do would be to promise to do my best. And so in a few years' time, I'd come back and I'd be able to make some sense of these things. That's not quite the way it works. So, faced with the Brazilian rock art, I was privileged to encounter, due to the generosity of André Cruz and his archaeological colleagues, I realised it was necessary to reverse my method and radically adapt what I had assumed and prepared up until then. Why did I have to do this? 
simply because I was faced with an explosion of expression that demanded I respond differently, and in the face of which it was clear that turning to it only in a cautious finale was inadequate. I'm tempted to say that the Brazilian rock art would not have accepted such a marginal role. On the basis of my encounter with, um, with this uh, rock art, I'm convinced it has a presence, even a character or personality, that demands a response adequate <coughs> to it. This is not intended as an anthropocentric projection, and rather as a recognition that artifacts can also have a presence in the world. In particular, the rock art I've seen here is like a carnival that has a life of its own. Uh, which is beyond the intentions and even the experiences of individuals caught up in it. I decided I had to follow the dance of the rock art rather than try to get to operate, to try to get it to operate with the choreography that I brought with me. So today I'm going to start with what I have recently learned a little about, um, and that is expression and liminality from the Brazilian rock art I have so far encountered. But I will also suggest some links to what I already know, both archaeologically and philosophically. In this way, I bring some hopefully reasonably well-established knowledge and a relational insight to bear on something very new to me. My relationship with Brazilian rock art is still uh, very new and quite raw. Nevertheless, it is already quite an intense relationship and one to which I want to do justice. I'm undoubtedly going to get some things wrong, but I'll try to get as much as possible right. I owe it to the rock hard, as well as to the experts who know so much more than I do. And I hope, in this way, I can contribute something uh, with the other strengths that I bring from elsewhere. So I'm going to start with a short clip uh, from some uh, rock hard. Now, first of all, it's not going to be the rock hard that um, I'm actually going to talk about today, um, because it's from further uh, further north in the Capybara um, National Park. Um, but I think it gives at least an initial sense as to, um, or, 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 or an initial encounter uh, with what is so effectively um, uh, entrancing about this rock art. And then I'll start talking about a lot of movement going on, but I'm going to come back to the question of animation in a slightly different context um, later on. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to be looking at uh, different ways in which uh, Minas Gerais rock art uh, contributes to the understanding of emergent expression. So, um, Peramasu in the north of Minas Gerais uh, 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 state has an array of sites, the oldest dating from around 12,000 uh, years ago to about 2,000 years ago. Uh, the greatest concentration of the intermediary San Francisco style dates to about six to 7,000 uh, years ago. Uh, now, these, um, the rock art is found in rock uh, shelters, 
the word abrigo, the Portuguese word abrigo, um, like the French word abri, uh, is, uh, expresses that this was somewhere that gave shelter, protection, and perhaps a vantage place. The English expression rock shelter aims at the same idea. We can see here directly what is in front of us. We can see uh, that it's rock, <laughs> we can see that it's a shelter um, from the spatial context that we ourselves can encounter still today. We don't have to have some theoretical um, projection in order to see how that space works. Although, of course, the details of how people lived in these rock shelters um, would be much more difficult um, to uh, establish. Now, archaeologists have established that the Abrigo shelter was not a permanent resting place. These peoples were nomadic hunter-gatherers who most probably moved in circles, returning at different seasons to the same places, not simply moving further and further in a linear direction from a starting point. Their sense of spatiality, and almost certainly also of time, because the two are intercalibrated, was thus circular rather than linear. The Abrigo shelter would have been inhabited at particular times of the year. For instance, when the waters and the rivers rose in the rainy season and the cooler air higher up would have been especially welcome. So the Abrigo shelter gave protection, but it was also a vantage place or a vantage point, not just for retreating from a demanding natural world, but also for preparing for the next move and for looking out onto the world. The views from these abrigo shelters is, without exception, spectacular. They are high up in the rock face and always have a view over the surrounding countryside, which is itself spectacular. The vegetation would have been different. Uh, the trees and their trunks would probably have been broader, making the view of the countryside somewhat different from what we see now. But the difference would mostly have been in the spacing between trees and the expanse that was visible between them rather than that the view was on a wholly different world. The Abrigo shelters are also striking in the position in their position in respect to deep caves that lie behind them. Archaeologists consider that these deep caves were not occupied, nor were they decorated with painting. The artwork is all on the rock face at the threshold of the deep cave. But this is not to say that the deep cave played no role in the affected environment of the Abrigo shelter, um, in, I, I conjecture. A, a view into the deep cave undeniably was the vault of us of the view onto the surrounding countryside. And these deep caves are, um, are often furnished with spectacular calcite formations, stalactites, stalagmites, some of them um, became huge pillars where an upright directed stalagmite meets a downward directed stalactite. It is impossible to think that these views, these views behind the, um, uh, the shelter, uh, were, uh, were not uh, also taken into account by the people who occupied uh, these sites. Thus the Abrigo shelter stands in a liminal position on the threshold between the world beyond and another dimension of the natural world within the rock. The Abrigo shelter operates as a threshold between the nature of the open world, which is bright, either due to the sun or the fabulous night skies, and on the other hand, the nature of a world that is dark and partially concealed. This liminal status is, I think, part of the power of these sites, these places. Admittedly and certainly, the Abrigo shelter also had a practical role um, and, uh, because it was a shelter and it was chosen for that reason. But the choice cannot have been simply practical, at least in our sense of the practical, um, which is often already set up in binary opposition between the aesthetic and the symbolic. The everyday lives of these people didn't, couldn't have separated out functionality from symbolic significance in the way that we think we can. It's clear that in the still accessible being and presence of the Abrigo shelter, that is in what we can still experience as a phenomenon now, just because these are sheltered places and they are symbolic, they're painted, we can see 
that convergence of the everyday with the symbol. At, um, I, I might need to move on even, even with my uh, slide. Um, all right. so, uh, so, so this is what I'm already talking about. Okay. Thresholds between art and nature. Um, and I've been talking about the situation of uh, the Abrigo shelter in relationship to the view, um, the view of the open world and uh, the uh, relationship to another nature which is behind uh, the, the shelter. Um, at Jeanne Leo, which is perhaps the superstar of Perouesu rock art, um, there is another way in which culture operates on the threshold of nature. The phenomenon is referred to as windows, um, uh, uh, or as André um, uh, in French, fenêtre. Um, I think they can also be thought of as frames. It's, it's not a disagreement, it's just another way of thinking for those who might be um, slightly um, more comfortable with the idea of a photographic frame. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about them as window frames so as to incorporate both those analogies to give the maximum um, sort of air to the idea. The rock gives a frame as a ledge under which some rock painting is positioned. It's almost as if these frames are natural micro shelters within the uh, micro shelters within the macro shelter of the abrigo shelter. The figures under, almost inside the window frame, are protected visually, but also practically from extreme weather, including sunlight. Now, I certainly can't tell exactly how these window frames worked for them. I use this frame for them um, as an abbreviation for the people who were around and about when this was created. Um, uh, but what is certainly indisputable is that there was an opportunity afforded by features of the relief of the rock, by the specificities of nature, and that this was taken up as a symbolic or cultural feature um, uh, out of something that otherwise would have been only, niche, only natural. So again, I'm suggesting that there is a, there's a threshold here between uh, the symbolic and the, and the natural. Another relation between nature and culture leads me to focus specifically on, um, on the abrigo, uh, which is called Indio. Um, this is uh, the rock shelter with possibly the oldest habitation dates at Perosu, although dating for the painting is not yet available. What struck me at this site is the horizontality of the arrangement of paintings, uh, whether they are figurative or abstract. In fact, the rock, I would suggest, again, I don't think that this is anthropomorphic, but um, it's the, the idea is that the rock has some potential in it. And that's what I mean by saying that the rock gives horizontal lines. And then, in a sense, the art follows those lines. The paintings celebrate, we might say, what was already there in the rock, its horizontal lines, with the repetition in the horizontal lines of the paintings. As if they were, as if the lines in the rock were being brought to the attention of the viewer and ornamented through painting, if you know, musical ornamentation. There's something else in the formation of the rock art at Indio that fascinates me. Um, above, but also beside the lines of the painted rocks, are numerous circular, natural indentations in the rock. The use of dots is fascinating in uh, Minas Gerais. Um, rock art, especially at Copais, uh, which uh, uh, this is a, a, a banner um, a textile um, reproduction of uh, Copais, and um, um, uh, um, Professor Proust um, allowed us to see this in, in his office, and um, uh, it gives a really good sense of the use of dots but also 
some sense of uh, horizontal lines. But it's the dots I'm focusing on at the moment. Um, and I'm asking a very speculative question. Could the natural indentations in the rocks, for instance, at Indio, possibly have been an inspiration or at least integrated into the practice of the painted dots? Um, this is a very speculative question. Um, certainly, uh, natural indentations at Indio certainly uh, were not, would not have been the only source of inspiration for the painted dots. Such painted dots are to be found throughout European Paleolithic art, for instance, in the final chamber at El Castillo in Cantabria in Spain, but also at, at Leo um, in the Pyrenees, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, as as André Cruz remarked, such points are one of the simplest artistic gestures, uh, which might also support the view that they belong to the initiation of rock art, even in deep caves, very much further back in, um, in prehistory uh, than Paralassou. We might additionally consider, I'm sure somebody would consider, that there may be a neurological source for such productions. But even if there were a neurological um, input, it's clear that these dots operated culturally, not just as the effects of the brain. I'm not at all denying that the brain is at work. I'm just saying that the brain needed to be culturally interpreted and interpreted. And Indio might suggest that nature itself presented encouragement for a cultural beginning. Um, I, I hope that Andre will mind um, if I um, report uh, something that he reported to me in an email that he very kindly sent to me at 6 a.m. this morning. And uh, that was to say that um, the most ancient rock graph graphism we have published from Minuscorats are engravings, incised lines and dots on a fallen block buried under uh, um, circa 10,000 radiocarbon years uh, uh, dating in Lapa do Boqueta. So these were made between 10 and 11,000 years ago. So um, the dots and the lines do seem to be but I also want to say something perhaps even more speculative than my last suggestion, but um, somehow I've got to go with it. Nature itself is imitative, not just for our anthropomorphic gaze, but for itself. Oh, those are more dots, but Right. Uh, this is uh, a tree with a cactus growing on it. Um, admittedly, it's problematic to think nature without indexing it to human experience. That is certainly true. But it's also problematic if we reduce everything to the human gaze. Indeed, the dialectic between these questions is another threshold, a liminality, which I believe any responsible interrogation of the world has to occupy. But what do I mean by nature superimposing on nature? I'll give an example from our experience of Perosu. On the way to the Jamalawa rock shelter, our guide showed us a tree on which was growing a cactus. The cactus imitated the tree, <coughs> developing its form as a repetition of the branches. And at a certain point in this long process of imitation, a branch that was in fact the cactus died. So the cactus um, that had been imitating the, um, the tree, um, and an expanse of that cactus died. Um, it was no longer green. It became brown, like the original branches of the tree. Now, I'm not suggesting that this form of imitation is intentional, at least not in the human sense of intentionality, just that it should be recognized as a natural form of imitation. This second degree of imitation, where the cactus not only follows the line of the tree's branches, but takes on the color of the tree, thus mimicking it even more closely, operates as a second threshold where the cactus almost becomes tree, even though the difference of species is preserved. So you have imitation and convergence, but you also have difference. There are many such instances of imitation within the animal and vegetable uh, kingdoms.
Another way uh, in which Brazilian rock art operates at thresholds is in the way that uh, perception contributes to emergent sense. Both, I believe, both for them, using that phrase, um, uh, and for us, using that in an equally problematic sense. As is well established, perception plays an important role in aesthetics and the way it has been constructed within Western philosophy. But it is evident that perception already played an important part for these prehistoric forebearers. We have already begun to consider this question through the discussion of window frames in the previous section. Ledges given or afforded by the rock were brought into participation with the art in showing it off. For the art is uh, for the art to be shown off, it was heightened in the perception of it by the perceiver. Uh, so the question of window frames is already perception. I now want to introduce three further perceptual dimensions of Minas Gerais rock art that contribute to its emergent perception. Um, the first is um, the relationship between the visible and the invisible, uh, in particular light as a condition of seeing and not seeing. Uh, the second is um, shadows uh, operating as quasi-objects. And the third, because I said there were three, although um, is the way in which um, uh, perception operates not only by showing but also by hiding um, something um, which is hidden from sight but is still present within the visual field. Uh, and there's also a question of what happens at the end. Okay, now, this um, uh, photograph is um, there with a purpose. It's to be contrasted with the one that follows it. The first one actually isn't overexposed. Um, like all the photos I took on our first trip out. The first was not overexposed, it was taken perfectly competently, but it was taken. Um, if I can get back to it, at a time of the day when the light rendered, if not invisible, then at least difficult to see what was there. And that's why, um, 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 indeed, um, uh, we needed to go back at a different, um, a bit later on, and see uh, things more clearly. So, um, the interesting thing about light is that light doesn't only make things visible. Light can also make things difficult to see. And uh, Murray has shown, I think very convincingly, um, that, uh, that seeing perception, um, oh, well, particularly um, perception which is seen, not all perception, but perception which is seen, requires light. And the light operates as a series of contrasts between light and dark. And I think that the rock art in Minas Gerais is capable of showing us that as well, before Merleau-Ponty, um, decided that he was going to tell us that philosophically. And I'm very glad he did. But I'm even more glad that we can see it from the rock art. Um, so, um, uh, but another feature, and this is also something that Merle Ponty is really on to, is the way in which perception um, requires shadows. If you see something without a shadow, you're either at the zenith of the day, or you're seeing something in some sort of virtual reality. And that's fine. But if you can't tell the difference between virtual reality and um, the other sort of reality, then you might be in some sort of difficulties. It's not that one is bad and one is good. But if you can't distinguish between them, then that might well lead to some problems. And something that we, I think, sometimes don't notice is the pervasiveness of shadows. And the way that, um, of, of course, it, 
has this has been talked about so <laughs> um, the whole idea of uh, sheer oscuro, um, Caravaggio um, um, uh, uh, brings us very much to the surface. But I think in our everyday life, sometimes we um, we and um, we annul the shadows. We don't we don't see them. We sort of edit them out because we think that they're not doing anything very important, unless it's very possible we want to get into the shape, which. So maybe people here would be more aware of that than, than I might be. But here what we see is a radical use of shadows, where the shadows become quasi-objects. And this is a way in which the, um, the uh, rock shelters uh, operate um, uh, within perception. They, um, uh, the, the, the painters must have been aware of uh, that they were um, they were either uh, that they were responding to shadows that are um, provided by the rock. Um, so this is a perceptual feature, which is, again is a response to a relationship between the natural and uh, the perceptive. This is supposed to be quite very good. But, so another. Rather fine, um, uh, rather fine shadow that's operating as a rock. Um, but another another aspect of the perceptual um, that I've mentioned is the importance of the hidden. So that um, that what is what is perceived stands in some at least potential relationship to what is not perceived and indeed even more radically to what is hidden. Um, and I'm going to now um, jump chronologically, geographically, uh, any which way, um, to um, uh, New Grange Passage to in Ireland, uh, which dates to about 5000 BP. Now, um, it's, it's a horrible reconstruction. It's not that it's a particularly horrible image, it's that the reconstruction of the tomb is highly questionable. However, what is not questionable is um, the, the stone at the front with the circular signs on it. So please try to ignore most of what lies behind it. Although the, the, the entrance is very important and is, I think, reliable, but it's, it's the sort of brick structures around it that at least is a good question. But what interests me here is, um, is um, hopefully will, will allow us to transcend the limitations of this image. Newgrange is famous for its decorated perimeter dominated by spiral forms, which inspired many other Neolithic sites in Ireland, Scotland and Orkney. Newgrange is also a prime example of the way in which passage tombs were positioned in relation to cosmological events, the rising or setting of the sun principally, as well as the continuing ongoing processes of seasonal changes with its functional and symbolic importance. Newgrange is oriented to the rising sun of the winter solstice, which in the Northern Hemisphere is on the 21st of December. At this time, the light of the sun falls on the back wall of the tomb. So imagine going down that, through that entrance and down a long passage to the back wall. So I said that the sun falls on the back wall of the tomb at the winter solstice. But we've got to remember here that this is Ireland in December. The chances that there will be no cloud and that the sun will appear sufficiently to do the work allotted to it by the tomb are slim. I don't know if you can imagine that, but it's, it's not like Bella Horizonte in winter. It really is <laughs> But the architect builders of the tomb knew that this could happen, and this was sufficient for them to undertake the enormous job of work that was demanded to construct the tomb. But what I'm interested in for now is a feature that is not so well known. The long passage of the tomb is undecorated. At least it is undecorated as far as normal perceptions goes. Above the ceiling of the rock panels in the, uh, um, in the passage um, are decorations that cannot be seen. 
These decorations hidden face up into, um, into the mound above the ceiling of the passage are invisible in contrast to the highly visible decoration which surrounds the passage too. While the decorations outside the tomb proclaim its presence and exhibit that it is there to be seen, not least because highly reflective quartz was used in conjunction with the engraved stones, the decoration within the ceiling of the passage cannot be seen and yet is there. Those who put it there clearly knew it was there and that it remained there. Whether this was generally known within their community is difficult to say. But perhaps it operated as a, um, as, um, as a sort of a mystery. But I would prefer to say that it operated liminally on the threshold between what was known and what was not known, between what was seen and what was not seen. And that it was exactly its occupation of that threshold that gave it, I think, a charge. Otherwise, why was it put there? I now want to move on to another way in which, um, uh, oh sorry, I, 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 again, I'm not doing justice to, uh, to uh, Brazilian art, I've got to remember. Um, I'm not back in my European domain. So, um, so here are, are I'm, I'm going back to those ledges that uh, allow there to be windows in the rock. So this way in which the, rock, the, the this art here is uh, the painting is partially you can see because it's partially under the ledge, um, and this is. Um, um, uh, something that could be so easily missed due to its position. Um, so again, something that is um, that is difficult to see, not quite as hidden as in the um, um, example from New Greenwich, uh, but still not exactly um, uh, shown off. Now, this is a, an, a, an example, I hope, of, uh, of uh, uh, a phenomenon um, that the phenomenon is definitely interesting, even, even if I haven't uh, successfully identified the case. Um, and it is that there are panels at Peros, Perosu, um, where there's a, a red wash of painting, of, of paint, and then figures are, um, are inscribed on that red wash. Um, but the interesting thing is that the, um, that the uh, red wash is only used in this sort of way if there was already something underneath, if there were already figures underneath. It's not done in an indifferent way. Um, it's done um, in order to uh, prepare the ground for what comes later. And um, that is also a way of um, a certain sort of hiddenness in the rock art. And as I mentioned um, about what happens at the end, and these are uh, at the end of Jean, Jean Rao, um, there, there are um, some little figures, uh, well, figures, uh, designs, um, I'm going to call them. Um, abstract, they're often called, um, and those are um, those are also in a sense hidden, although they're visible. But because they're right at the end, then uh, there's something liminal about them. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, another way in which the liminal is um, is to be found in Mies um, uh, rock. Um, so, um, Mesmerized uh, rock art is uh, characterized by the use of superimpositions. That is where, where one painting is on top of another. And they are intentionally on top of each other because um, they, um, uh, there is often what came before, what is underneath, is still visible, not exactly through what comes after, but along with 
what comes after. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time. Um, so um, I think I'll just um, go with the, uh, the slides now. Um, so for instance, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, one at uh, Cerro de Cipo, where there is a jaguar with a deer, sort of hidden inside it, uh, superimposed on it. Um, there uh, also, uh, Cerro de Cipo, um, very much um, uh, um, a feature of Cerro de Cipo is the superimpositions of colors on one another. And, and these, are, these use of colors are significant in ways that I'm not going to be able to go into today. But there's certainly significant for chronological dating, uh, for identification of styles and traditions. Um, so they're, they're very important. Um, but they are also forms of expression. Um, now, I just want to point out to you, because as I said, you know, I, I sort of feel like I, I should bring something with me that I actually do know about. Um, and um, superimpositions in late Paleolithic cave art are extremely um, prevalent. Uh, so, um, so this is from um, the Hobbes Bills of Glasgow. Um, Again, these, um, these forces are superimposed on top of a, a oryx. It may well be that you know, it's so easy to see the horses, but the oryx is, is very definitely there, and very definitely visible. Um, now, one of the interesting things about superimpositions, whether they're in Brazilian rock art or whether they're in uh, late Paleolithic cave art, is um, that there is a really rich variety of the way in which superimpositions happen. Um, so sometimes they happen as a form of, um, uh, and here I was very glad to find that my terminology converged with that of Andre Cruz, um, that they can, can be seen as a form of respect in the sense that the, um, the, the following artwork lets what was already there be seen. Um, this for me is one of the um, uh, prime examples of this. Again, it's from the Hall of the Books of Glasgow, where the later horse uh, was painted so that it is seen, but it does not interfere with, it does not cover over um, the uh, oryx, which in a sense frames it. Um, but sometimes um, there is um, um, there is more of a uh, less of this um, almost polite respect. Sometimes there's um, uh, there's more of something like uh, a refusal, um, and uh, so we need to recognise those sorts of uh, superimpositions as well. Um, so I think I'm going to come to my conclusion <laughs> and. Um, so, um, I have argued that emergent expression um, is, is experiencing in Escarice rock art through relations between paintings and nature, through st strategic deployments of perceptual features, through interrelations between layers of artworks opera operating as superimpositions, and if I had more time, I would have also argued that these, um, these threshold relations um, are particularly um, uh, 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 apparent in the relations between the figurative and the abstract. In all of these ways, Minas Gerais rock art shows up an emergent expression in the phenomenon, in rock art as situated in the world, in ways that do not need excessive extrapolation or projection. Although admittedly the total avoidance of interpretation is never possible without giving up on our access to the phenomena without which we couldn't even talk about uh, what we don't know. I've suggested throughout this presentation that the emergent expressions are relational and operate over thresholds and transitions. I have not tried to analyse the concept of liminality here. That is for another time and place. I've tried to show how transitions are ongoing and how determinations require the indeterminacy out of which they emerge. 
This is not to say that there is no determinacy, but it is to say that there is, as long as we are alive, no absolute determinacy, existentially speaking at least. A crucial undertaking in aesthetics is to take emergent expression seriously, not to lose sight of it in epistemological or moral questions, which are also important, but not sufficient for living in a world. In this sense, aesthetics is like politics, in taking the transitional seriously and showing how we should expect ongoing process rather than reject it, however difficult that might be. Emergent expression is a necessary condition for cognition, for ethical relations, for political struggle. But it is also something else. Emergent expression is the joy of entering into things which we do not and cannot wholly control, and yet in which we can participate. Aesthetics as a discipline has the capacity to express the general existential condition of openness to possibility. This makes aesthetics an opening where differences and recognition both flourish in interdisciplinary and intradisciplinary work. <laughs> the lack of ultimate boundaries for aesthetics is its strength. Like Minas Gerais rock art, in aesthetics just like in life, we keep beginning again, even though not from scratch. We always bring something with us from before. The difference between aesthetics and life, like the difference between art and life, is very difficult to pin down. But it is, I think, something like this. In aesthetics, we have a sense, an emergent sense of a higher degree, of the unavoidability of beginning again and again, without this having to be a melancholic repetition that would kill life rather than facilitate its pr proliferation into different forms of being and life. Thank you. Thank you both for those incredibly rich talks. We have some time for uh, questions, so we'll just let people who are leaving take a minute. And um, we will ask you, because we're streaming the event, um, for you to take the microphone and ask your question in the microphone. And please be brief, because our time is short. Questions? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your talks, very interesting both. Uh, I have a question for each speaker. First, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Fructo, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, thinking about feelings, um, it is true that in the last 20 years, more or less, with the works of Damasio, we are more aware of our emotional side, our emotional life. But it's also true that uh, we still divide our rational and emotional uh, behavior. And uh, when we say somebody is emotional, we imagine this person is unstable, unreliable, so be careful. So we still, I don't think, we still don't recognize or acknowledge our emotional uh, side in our everyday life. And uh, I want to refer to this idea that when we go to work every day, we're expected to be uh, rational, logical, like in the super trap song, and uh, we're expected to do our work no matter what feelings we have that day. Uh, we're not asked if you're feeling depressed or sad or cynical in your work or whatever. So we expect to do our work no matter the feelings we have. That's true. So um, the question would be how can we acknowledge and give our feelings the place where we're supposed to, we're supposed to have and also be productive and capitalist and live in our industrial culture, that would be the question. And uh, for Professor Hughes, that would be very interesting. Um, well, when we talk about um, what you call prehistoric art, I think it's the word, it's always difficult to talk about art in the first sense. And we know this is very problematic because when we call it art, we all also give it its properties of expression and intention that belongs to our modern sense of art, which is difficult. Um, these windows, well, these people were painting, 
Um, we find them interesting because we are used to flat surfaces, can't stretch canvas, so of course we find this unusual and we think that they're taking advantage of something, I suppose. But we have to, I was thinking that that's all they have. They didn't have the, the flat surface or the canvas, so I suppose they were just using what they thought was there. And they always use the surface as it comes, so I don't know if we would think that this was special for them. It wasn't really special for them, I suppose. It's special for us, but uh, they're using what they have because that's the surface they, they use every day, I suppose. So, that's it. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, let me say my, in, a, in, a, in a very general way, my interest was not, if I really got your point, was not quite, it's not quite on the level you are still using the interest in. My, I have a specific question about the roles of emotion in democracy, so about the political function. Of, of emotions or let's say feelings. Feelings cover emotions, moods, effects, sensations. Um, so when you ask me how can we how can we care for as theorists and maybe on a practical level uh, for a better integration of emotions in our everyday life, which is structured by many uh, vectors, among others, of course, economical ones. I, I would say, well, then we have to start a new discussion um, when it is about my question. How should we deal with feelings in democratic politics? I try to give an answer. We have to transform them, we have to present them. Where do we learn that? In aesthetic experience, it's very simple. Yeah. One aspect I would I would pick up one aspect in your description because it comes up so often that we still and you you, you seem to follow that, but correct me uh, that that tradition that we say well our everyday life is in principle structured by. Uh, rationalist uh, reflections and actions. And that means a certain concept of rational energy, namely an instrumental. We know we get up and we have a certain aim, we have to go to the university because there is a, a small meeting with colleagues, so I get up early at the right time, take the tram, etc. Everything is following that <coughs> That line, and in so far I follow. I'm following an instrumental concept of rationality. But in fact, I always would say the the, the more we describe in detail what we are in fact doing when we are sitting with our colleagues in a meeting and have to decide about something, solving a problem. How should we deal with, the, with, with so many students in a certain discipline, etc. Instrumental rationality. But the way we decide that is, is grounded by, by many diverse, subtle emotions. So there is no split, no dualistic split between reasoning and following emotions. That split comes really up with Nietzsche and the pragmatism. John Dewey is right in that. Because we tend to speak about reason as a noun. There is something like reason with a capital R. No, it's not. It's just a grammar or our grammar that invites us or seduces us to do so. If we think of reasoning, as a verb, as an activity, the situation changes completely because when we are reasoning, we would say, oh, well, that's something, reasoning. This is, this is the move, look at me, this is the movement we make. My, my body demonstrates.
demonstrates now, with all the feelings I can express in such a small movement, what reasoning means. Let's let's stop with that, with that dualism. It leads to nothing. For 2,500 years we do that. It leads to nothing. Thanks very much for um, for your question. Oh, this is oh, sorry. I thought this was cool. Oh, yes. Um, so I I I really um, in a way thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to say uh, something about the difficulty about talking about art in the first place. I mean, we talk about art, but it's not because um, there is a good um, definition for what counts as art. We, we talk about art because we need, well, first of all, we need to experience art. Uh, we need it in our lives. And then we need to talk about it. But that does not mean that the words that we use are particularly adequate or helpful. So I think it's actually really good that prehistoric art uh, makes it um, even more difficult to talk about than maybe the art that we are already somewhat used to. Um, because it shows that art is a continual challenge rather than something that we've already uh, categorized and, and understood. And, and here I think that there is, although um, please forgive the um, completely um, a chronological um, analogy, but I think that there is a certain parallel between um, contemporary arts and prehistoric arts, not just because they're not, they're both arts, which are both amazingly um, diverse and not easily categorizable into binaries of one thing and not another thing. Um, um, but they, they are incredibly diverse, um, and, but not just because they're not within the white cube, but because um, they complicate the relationship of art. All of them, both contemporary art and prehistoric art, complicate the role of art within our lives and show how there is um, the possibility at least for a continual intertwining of art and, and life. Um, but I also want to, um, of course, respond to your specific question about, about the use of the rock face and, and, and relief. I think there is very good evidence that, um, that these, um, these painters and elsewhere engravers did not simply take the rock surface as it was. I, I'll give just a couple of examples, and obviously singular examples aren't going to prove anything very much, but they might at least give a suggestion. Um, at Chauvet Cave, um, which is from about 32, maybe 36,000 years ago, um, um, the uh, archaeological experts, uh, Carol Fritz and uh, Giuseppe, have written about how, um, and this is really early in um, Paleolithic, cave art, not as early as the earliest that has been found, because that's in Indonesia, not Europe. Um, but, um, but anyway, this is early, um, and there was, uh, there's evidence for preparation of the rock surface, where they actually scraped away some of the natural features of the rock um, before they proceeded to add something. So that was already within their range of possibilities. Um, if they also chose to work with configurations of the rock, then it was not because they hadn't thought of anything else and not because they were incapable of doing anything else. Um, um, uh, and um, another thing that I think is, 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 is really um, um, suggestive of, of the select, of processes of selection that went on um, uh, are that um, both within the uh, Brazilian um, uh, uh, Abrigo shelters and within uh, late Paleolithic um, cave art is the surfaces that are not, not used. There are lots of surfaces that are not used. And in, certainly in cave art, um, the late Paleolithic cave art, there are many very nice, accessible, flat surfaces that even I think, well, I, you know, I could have, you know, but they didn't do that. They chose their surface with care. 
And they often chose places that were out of the way and difficult to get at. But not always, because that's good, the whole of the bulls is not going great auditorium. So there were very complex choices that were made. And it certainly, I am confident, was not that they just took what was there and were sort of constrained by their limitations. In fact, I want to reverse it and say they were already working in 3D. It's us who has to learn how to use 3D again. Okay. So I've been told that there is a performance that is waiting on us, and I will have to bring the questions and answers to the end at this point. Um, hopefully, if you have questions that you didn't get to ask, you'll be able to see Professor Kukul and Professor Hughes during the conference, and please ask those. But I, I'll need to uh, bring this to an end. Let's express our appreciation for these wonderful talks.